Welcome to Kevin and Brian's Horror Drive-In Theater Podcast, where each week we cover the latest horror news, shorts, and two creature feature reviews. This week after the news, we'll cover the drive-in classic, The Stuff, followed by a discussion of two short films, Blackbird and Nightcrawler, and then the modern horror feature film, Crucible of the Vampire. The popcorn is fresh, so sit back and relax. Here we go. But first, the news. What is news? Well, a heads-up plan ahead for the Motor City Nightmare Convention at the end of April 2019. This annual event is coming up in Novi, Michigan, April 26th through 28th, with all the usual convention goodness of vendors, panels, a film festival, signings, and celebrities. The likes of Doug Bradley, Ashley Lawrence, Andrew Robinson, and Simon Bamford of Hellraiser fame. As well as Dee Wallace and William Sadler, and a whole bunch of others too. It looks like it's going to be a big deal and a lot of fun. Tickets and full details are available on their website, www.MotorCityNightmares.com. And just to clarify, that's Pinhead and Kirsty and Kirsty's father and one of the Cenobites are all going to be there. I looked that, that up. That is awesome. Simon Bamford, he's like the fat Cenobite he's who the never fat speaks. One, the fat one with the glasses who had no lines. Yeah, yeah that's just great. I really want his <laughs> autograph. He's memorable, but he, was he, memorable, he never yeah. says anything. No, no, he didn't. Hmm. I don't know. If I got to see Andrew Robinson, I'd probably talk to him more about Garak than uh, Hellraiser. Garak? From... Uh, Deep Space Nine. He was the tailor. Oh, right. Yes. Probably the most interesting character on the series. I forgot that was him under the makeup, yeah. William Sadler. Now, he's played a hundred different creeps in a hundred different movies. When was he ever in a horror movie, though? I, he must He was have Death been. with Bill and Ted. He must have been. That doesn't really count as horror, though. Yikes. I don't know specifically. He's been in so many things. He's always a bad guy. He's always creepy or weird. But He was I in an episode of Tales from of the Crypt. horror movie, though. He was in an episode of Tales from the Crypt. He was an executioner. Well, okay. well it was a horror. Tales from the Crypt. Those are all horror. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a good one. Uh, it does. Late April. Yep. Check it out. Second thing, it's reported that Warner Brothers is developing a horror-tinged spinoff to Aquaman that may come out before the Aquaman 2 sequel. I guess they're having some delays on the sequel, some production issues. Hmm. Details are still coming, and no director has yet been chosen, but apparently this film will not include any of the superheroes or Atlanteans, but will revolve around some ordinary people exploring the Mariana Trench and encountering the deadly aquatic creatures that attacked Aquaman and Mira in the Aquaman film. I think this is a potentially cool idea and could start a trend. I think this sounds like a rumor. No, it's more than a rumor. But mm. just think if they started doing this with superhero movies. You know, the superheroes are off busy and ordinary people are dealing with these horrible monsters and horrible villains. And They called that it's Cloverfield, got, it's got didn't potential. they? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see how that turns out. It sounds like it's a long way off. Mm. Third... The Horror Writers Association has granted Graham Masterson their Lifetime Achievement Award for 2019. His first horror novel, The Manitou, was published in 1976 when he was 30. The Manitou then went on to the big screen movie starring Tony Curtis. And the book was better than the movie, I thought. Man, I really hated that. I, I saw that movie over and over when it was on late night reruns. I saw it a couple times. And on it late got night to the point, too. you know, having an Indian chief growing in your back <laughs> turned out to be like a family joke. It's less jokey in the book. I think I, they handle I, it a lot I've better. I've got a headache. I don't. I, I got a headache. <laughs> Are you sure you don't have an Indian growing in your back? Man, that was dumb. The book is better. <laughs> the book is genuinely creepy. He's turned out over forty horror novels and short story collections as well as numerous historical novels and thrillers. Said to be still writing, his latest book, Dead Men Whistling, came out just last year. I haven't read all of his stuff. Read some of his stuff. I've gone through and looked good. up some of his no. titles, and I honestly can't remember reading any of them. I read The Jinn and uh, Dead Man Walking, The House That Jack Built. I think I've read all of those. I really should look up more of his stuff, though, because I've enjoyed them all. 
And he is good. Very good. It'd take a while to catch up on everything. That's the problem with these long career writers. You look at his bibliography on the web or on Amazon, and it's just pages and pages of books and titles and collections. and Yeah. Got to collect them all. <laughs> Fourth, Gizmodo has alerted us to the coming of a new board game, Horrified Universal Monsters, by Ravensburger, that comes with the tagline, The Stakes Have Been Raised. Working as a team of two to five players, the strategy game pits humans against monsters, working to bring them down together. In addition to Dracula, hence the raised stakes, the monster antagonists include the Wolfman, Frankenstein and his Bride, the Mummy, the Invisible Man, and Creature from the Black Lagoon. This is expected to be hitting the shelves around August 1st, with a retail of probably around thirty-four ninety-nine. One of the features that they say it's going to have is detailed little figurines of all the creatures. That would be a good thing to have. And I could, you know... <laughs> they can do the Invisible Man. <laughs> I just, mean, just I mean, a they pedestal. could. They could, <laughs> like you know, the code and just the head is missing. But I was thinking, you know, just you know, that'd be a good prank to play on people. <laughs> just, here's the little. Here pedestal. it is. I don't see anything. <laughs> exactly. He's the Invisible Man. But no, the Invisible he's Man. Naked. He's wearing like a suit and the, the, in the bandages movie and the glasses yeah, and yeah. stuff. There's he, ways they yeah. could do it, but that was the first thing I thought of. Like, no, he's naked. He's, <laughs> don't you see him there? <laughs> Huh, yeah. <laughs> and last for this week, Shudder Horror Network has a fascinating-looking original documentary, Horror Noir, showing now, with discussion and clips of black Americans in horror films, from the earliest appearances to black exploitation movies, to the heroes and even sometimes survivors of today. It sounds like it covers a history of blacks in movies through the years, and how their screen roles have reflected and influence their roles in society as things have changed. And they talk about the classics, Blackula and uh, Night of the Living Dead. That was the first time that a uh, that a black guy was a hero in a horror movie. It didn't work out so well for him. No, no, he wasn't a survivor guy, but you know, it was a it was a first. Romero <laughs> was uh, progressive that way, but it talks about all kinds of history of. You know, what was going on at the different times of these different eras of movies. And, well, you know, I sounds, haven't seen the movie really yet, interesting. but the trailer does make it sound interesting. Yeah, it does. They interview one person that says in the horror movie, the black person is always the first to die. That's usually true. It used to be Maybe more not so. so much true anymore because it's yeah. gotten to be a little too much. Of it. it was so, such a, so obvious it became a kind of a trope. Yes, yeah. So now the goal is to change things up. And one lady says, well, you know, we've always liked... Horror movies, but they haven't always liked us. <laughs> yeah, that's because of that trope. So we'll look into seeing that one and reviewing it for you soon. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you can watch it yourself on the Shutter Network. And that's it for this week's news. Time to head over to the drive-in and see what's playing. What kind of old movie have we got this week? The Stuff from 1985. That's a creative title. Just The Stuff? The Stuff. And it's literally The Stuff. Okay, well, The Stuff from 1985 stars Michael Moriarty, Andrea Marcovici, Garrett Morris, Paul Servino, and has a few cameos, people like Danny Aiello and Patrick O'Neill. Speaking of black people in horror movies, Garrett Morris. Yep, and we'll talk about him a little more as we get through this thing. He's not a survivor guy. He Spoiler. did not get treated well. No. Funny, though. <laughs> good part. I liked his part. Oh, yeah, yeah, very yeah. good. Okay, so the whole point of this one is, well, okay, the first, very first scene, there's an old man walking through a mine at night. He just looks down and sees this white goop bubbling up through the ground. It's like oil bubbling, only it's white. White, goopy, yeah. And if you saw this white slime glooping up out of the ground, what would be the first thing you'd do? Stick your finger in it and then taste it. Well, I don't know if I would, but that's what this guy did. Well, I think that once he touched it, I think it immediately started to influence him, and he had the compulsion to taste it, and it had him from there. It's like me and pizza. Yeah. yeah. Once you touch it, once you're you touch it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have to eat it. So the man shoves it into his mouth, and immediately it's, we could sell this to people. The very next scene has jumped forward sometime, and we see a package container called The Stuff in a little boy's fridge. 
The boy's up in the middle of the night, and he sees it crawling around inside the refrigerator. The cup has spilled, and it's, yeah, exploring. <laughs> but nobody believes that he saw this. And uh, the next day, the little boy goes to the grocery store and attacks all the little tubs of the stuff, destroying hundreds and hundreds of tubs of, stuff. tubs of the stuff. It looks a lot like yogurt. It's going to sound really old calling it the stuff over and over. You know that stuff. How many times are we going to yeah, say the stuff a lot. in this review? <laughs> stuff and things. <laughs> Meanwhile, a competing dessert company hires Mo Rutherford, played by Michael Moriarty, an ex-FBI agent, to find out what's up with the stuff. And they want to espionage it and steal it or improve on it. Or duplicate know. it. But they can't. They, they tried analyzing it. It doesn't break down, and they can't figure out how to make it. So they set him on the case to steal it or find out how. He starts out with the FDA who approved it for sale suspiciously quickly. And all the board members who disappeared are, you know... Either out of the country or dead. Yeah, suspiciously, except for this one guy. Initially, it goes back and forth between scenes of this kid and his family and his progress, solving the case detective style, closing in on the source and more information about the stuff. Yeah, during his investigations, he runs into Chocolate Chip Charlie who is a Famous Amos clone. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you've ever bought Famous Amos cookies, you got the picture of the guy on the cover. This is Chocolate Chip Charlie. Chocolate Chip and Charlie. He, and he's a hoot. That's Garrett Morris. And he's been put out of business because the stuff has taken all dessert and candy business. And that company basically bought his company out from under him. So the two of them uh, go to this town called Stater, which is where the FDA did all their testing, and everybody in town has disappeared for some reason. And they're chased out of town by a group of guys who, when punched or hit with something, they start spraying white goo. Not blood, just goo. Ew. And in the meantime, while he's trying to figure this out, we keep seeing commercials and billboards where the stuff is being marketed um, and is getting more and more popular. They have stuff stands like a ice cream stand where people are all lined up little getting, restaurants getting devoted to nothing of stuff else and, yeah. it's everywhere yeah it's becoming ubiquitous so about this time they start getting recognized by people who have never seen them before wherever they go there's people who say here they come on radios and so forth they're clearly they're being followed about this part time the the young boy jason is cornered by his family and sent to his room to eat a tub of the stuff. And his family's not acting right anymore. It's something weird about this family. Mm -hmm. But he flushes it down the toilet. And it doesn't go down. It doesn't want to go, go down. It, it doesn't go down without a fight. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of blob-like. Not as aggressive as the blob, you know, if you've seen that movie. But, but it moves but on its, its own. It does move on its own somewhat. Yeah. But he eventually gets it to flush. And then he fakes eating it with shaving cream, which, which is probably gross. almost as bad. Yeah. <laughs> Runs out of the house barfing, <laughs> chased by his family, just in time for Mo to swing by. Oh, Mo read his, his story in the newspaper about the kid who thought the stuff was alive and destroyed the grocery. And so he shows up just in time to rescue the kid. And also along the way, they meet up with a TV publicist who has done advertising for the stuff and has realized the error of her ways, and she joins them as well. The three of them converge on the quarry where the stuff comes out. The source. They pump it directly out of the ground and into these big old tanker trucks. Yeah, they don't manufacture it or anything. They just bottle it up. And at this point, it starts getting strange. Mo starts plants a getting strange. <laughs> Mo plants explosives that he's carried with him. He just happens to have a bunch of plastic explosives in just the right amount. It's all set with detonators and ready to go. And he sets the explosives that he brought with him around the extraction site and blows it up and it's buried. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to stay buried long. They know that they're going to dig it up again. There's enough people under its control that it's not going to get stopped. So then he runs and meets up with Paul Sorvino, a crazy paramilitary nut who actually lives in a castle. And has his own little army, his own little militia. These are some crazy loony, loony tunes, that's for sure. And Mo just feeds right into his conspiracy theory beliefs, like, oh, there's this stuff that's taking people over. 
and it's out there and it's poison and it's getting into all the food supply. And but is it a con- <laughs> is it a conspiracy if it's true? Well, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, it just feeds right into it. So the colonel, he joins up with them. He agrees to help them fight the guys at the factory. And he's got probably the best line in the movie at this point. I kind of like the sight of blood, but this is disgusting. As they shoot the shoot the white goo out of people. Infected people, and they yeah, it's white goo instead of blood. Turns out the colonel also owns a couple of radio stations, and they go to one of those to broadcast a national warning. And it works. And they catch up with Chocolate Chip Charlie, who almost immediately self destructs. Yeah, he he gets Nicole alone in a soundproof room and. They think that he's okay still, and he's not. He's been fully infected. He almost gets her and the kid. Well, the stuff does, not not him. Basically, it fills you up like it, like you, the bodies are just a hollow shell, and the stuff is Full of animating. way too much stuff. Yeah, yeah. You can fill a room with all the stuff that's in Charlie. White goopy. But anyway, they get away from him. They make their broadcast and warn, warn everyone to cook their stuff because it's kind of... It, it's not fireproof. The people fight back, and the factories and restaurants are destroyed. They then force the distributors to eat it. Mm-hmm. But still, the final scene shows that it survives in the black market. Well, it was kind of funny, too, when they went to the distributors, who were just out to make money regardless, and knowing what the stuff was, they've come up with a new product called The Taste that's only 12% stuff. It won't fully take... The, mar- the customer's over, but it's just enough to make it addictive. <laughs> <laughs> and so Mo and Jason force-feed them a bunch of stuff that they've saved, and that's the end of the evil corporate guys. So, okay, so the company's not going to exist anymore, at It's least. over and done, and what do you think? Overall? Mm-hmm. I remember it being better than that. You've seen it it before. I saw it before when it came out. I have not seen it before. This is my first time. It's a little bit dated. Special effects aren't aren't that good. I think the story's pretty funny. It's got a lot going for it, but you know, maybe eh, six out of ten. You say the story's funny. I thought it was funny. Not scary. Not very. It's not much of a horror movie. No. It's more of a spoof than a horror. I mean, it's, you know, you think people, it was intended to? people being hollowed out and, you know, taken over by alien goo or prehistoric goo. They never say it's ter- that it's alien. They, but could, they don't know what it is. They don't. It just bubbles up out of the earth. So, you know, maybe it's always here, you know, prehistoric or whatever. Okay. The, the main star is Mo, played by Michael Moriarty. And he is obnoxious in every single scene he is in. Well, he's good at his job. He's smooth, and that's part of his appeal and how he gets people to trust him and and go along with him. And Yeah, I thought that really worked well. He's kind of obnoxious in every movie I've ever seen him in, though. <laughs> Is he just being I, himself? I, I wonder if it's a, a, he plays the same character over and over or if he's just like that. Is he not acting, then they just give him new lines? <laughs> Yeah, watch him in It's Alive sometime. He's I do remember that. He's the yeah. main character. He's all heroic and stuff, but... Man, he's obnoxious there, too. Same kind of obnoxiousness, yeah. I did like where a lot of, a lot of the factory scenes looked like they were shot in a yogurt factory. Maybe they were. Where they're putting the stuff in the in the tubs. Oh, I bet it probably was. It's about the only thing I can think of that looks like that. Mm-hmm. I like seeing the Where's the Beef lady. Yeah, she made an appearance. She'd been dead for 50 years, and everybody remembers that commercial still. And she's in a commercial for the stuff, and, of course, she says, Where's the stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have a lot of gore in it. Uh, oh, uh, there's only two things that I noticed with much in the way of gory violence. One guy gets run over a truck pretty good. Yeah, but he was already possessed by the stuff, and it was really just a bunch of stuff gushing out. It wasn't blood and guts. It was still a pretty good effect. Yeah. yeah. And then Chocolate Chip Charlie's meltdown. <laughs> yeah, literal. That was the literal best Literal meltdown. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he has the best one. <laughs> Still, though, it's not really much of a horror film. It, it, it's got some horror-esque scenes in it. Um, I mean, people being taken over by this parasitic goo sounds kind of horrifying. Mm-hmm. Like you said, though, it's more of a somewhat dark comedy parody kind of thing. Yeah. I'd give it a solid 3 of 10. That's all? It was pretty oh, bad. I'd give it a 6. It's kind of fun, but it's in no way would I call it good. I'd call it fun and pretty good. Okay. Yeah. 
Definitely watchable. Definitely you should check it out if you haven't seen it. Speaking of definitely watchable, we have two, two short films this time to go over. What do we got? We have one from 2016 called Blackbird. This one's about 16 minutes long, and it tells a whole story from start to finish. It's got a plot and characters and I loved does it. pretty good. I thought it was great. A biker wakes up on the road. He staggers down the road and gets back on his motorcycle. He's clearly taken a spill or yeah. something, maybe, you think? And he's still kind of dazed and confused when this barefoot woman runs past. The two of them get together and they watch an eclipse, which was odd. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of an implication where you wonder, well, maybe they're both dead. And this is some kind of afterworld thing. Or post-apocalyptic or something like that. Things don't seem quite right. She's barefoot in her, in her nightgown running down the street. Which is kind of odd. And he's fully w dressed up in motorcycle leathers with a helmet on. You can't see any part of him. I kind of thought he was going to be a robot. Except he gets a voicemail saying, uh, hi, this is, did he say a name? I it's, think he I did. think it's just me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he gets a voicemail. But Let's not get into that. Yeah, trying to reach you and yada yada. So yeah. anyway, after the eclipse, they ride, a, ride together on the motorcycle and find shelter in an abandoned house. He doesn't remember who he is or anything else, but she says some things are best forgotten. Yeah, she's clearly been through some kind of trauma. And I guess the name of the movie comes from the song that she sings. It's this really creepy song about someone sneaking around outside the house. And then they come in. And then coming inside. And then they get you. He's coming closer. Yeah, it's a creepy, creepiest lullaby ever. And then she has this dream where she woke up handcuffed to a bed. But I think we should probably stop there. We don't want to spoil this. Yeah. Because you really should see this one. It's very good, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't what I expected. The whole voicemail thing made me think, no, he wouldn't be dead because there's no voicemail in the afterlife, probably. Probably. And this sounded like a real voicemail. But you don't know for sure, and you don't know for sure what's going on. But then at the end, you do. It's good. Yeah, it's all explained at the end. It's good. Okay, and the other short film was one called Nightcrawler. This was from around 2015, mm -hmm. and it's at one minute long. It's it's actually, one, I don't think it's even one minute. It's one of those micro-horror movies. Yeah. Well, there's this girl walking home late at night. Uh, it's kind of, is it in a filter or just blurry? It's, I think it's filter for effect. Okay. Yeah. She's, She's walking through a tunnel at night. One of those scary tunnels that you're not supposed to walk through at night. And there's a scary guy following her. And we shouldn't see We're her. not sure that he's following her. But then she drops her keys, and, yep, he's following yeah, her. Yeah, he is. And you're going to have to watch the rest. Yep. There's not much we can say with a one-minute <laughs> Yeah, there's, one only, minute there's only, other than a thumbs up. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, definitely worth checking out. We have the links here on the show notes. As always. Okay, and we watched a new movie. Actually, this is a brand-new movie. only was released uh, in February, so barely two weeks ago. A British film. Crucible of the Vampire. And doesn't that sound like a classic uh, Hammer film title? Or, you know, one of those from the golden age of horror It's kind the of Crucible. It's the Vampire. Yeah. No, it's crucible the Crucible of, of the, the vampire. vampire. Pretty much you could put any noun in front of of the Vampire and have a Hammer film. Hammer of the Vampire. Teeth of the Vampire. Yeah. Snack food of the Vampire. Anyway, this one starts out with a flashback. England, 1649, before color had been invented. It was in black and white in the beginning. Ezekiel Fletcher is accused of sorcery, witchcraft, and necromancy by the witch finder. His dead daughter has been seen wandering the woods. The, the Ezekiel claims, no, 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 Lydia, the name he's been calling, is his cat's name. And he's just sitting around this cauldron cooking his dinner and playing the flute and, you know, just hanging out. He's innocent. And it all seems pretty innocent to it, us. These guys have just wandered upon him in the woods and they, they falsely, hang him. Falsely accused. Yep. And, yeah, because, you know, riches aren't, witches aren't real and all that witch hunting stuff was just basically organizational murder, right? Yeah. Yeah. Except later on we find out that yeah, maybe yeah, he wasn't maybe as innocent he wasn't as he looked. Innocent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, then we jump up to England, 2017. And they've invented color. <laughs> Back to color, yes. Girl named Isabel goes to her boss's office. He's the curator of the museum, and she's the assistant curator. 
and he shows her a picture of a stone cauldron, it's called the stone cauldron, that was owned by the Witchfinder General. It's pre-Roman period and very old. It's only half a cauldron. They only have half a cauldron, and they've got a call that says this other guy has found the other half of the cauldron, and she needs to go to his country home and determine if that's the case or not. And then they would have a whole cauldron. But it's, it's called the Stone Cauldron because that was the Witchfinder guy's name. Yeah, he was Mr. Stone. Mm-hmm. But uh, fraud is really a big deal with these things, and they really don't think it's probably real, but... Somebody needs to check it out. So she's on a mission. She takes a train to this remote place out in the English countryside. And, of course, because it's remote, there's no cell phone signal. It's a big old creepy house, which it's surprises huge, no one. huge house. Beautiful yeah. house. Which is being restored as a, what, a museum? Or what? what is it going to be? Restoring back to its houseness. Just restoring it. Yeah. Okay. They said it was a girls' school, and they were restoring it back to its houseness again. Well, parts of it are beautiful. And parts of it are kind of run down, beat up, been used for different things, obviously. Because it was a girl's dormitory school, and so they had converted some of the rooms, it looked like, and kind of old and beat up in some parts, but huge. The caretaker and his wife greet her, but their daughter Scarlet is nowhere to be found that afternoon. She does, however, show up that evening after dark for dinner. Weirdest, most awkward dinner. Yeah, yeah, very much so. They're very strange people. They're All of them are very people. strange, yeah. 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 So that night, Isabel sees someone creeping around in the dark hallway. She goes up to them, and they're gone. Scarlet, when accused, denies that it was her. Of course, the next day, while Isabel is down in the basement digging at the cauldron, Scarlet goes through all her stuff, stealing her panties and phone. <laughs> now, the the missing pair of panties, I could see you might think, oh, I forgot to pack that pair, but you're going to notice the phone's gone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what she was thinking. She wanted it, I guess. <laughs> a little later on... It didn't work, because, you know, no service. A little later on, Isabel goes to town, and the, she meets up with a gardener who works for these people, and he tells her a story about the old gardener bleeding to death from falling into some barbed wire which most people thought was suspicious, but there was no proof. And I liked how throughout it, up well into it, uh, you know, it's Crucible of the Vampire, and you know it's a horror movie. Uh, who's the vampire? Who Are they all vampires? Is there one vampire? Vampire we haven't seen yet? Or is there no vampire and she's hallucinating? Yeah. These things are always possible. I thought they did a nice job of not making that clear and making you guess of what, well, who is who and who's the bad guys. When we're probably out of spoiler territory there because we're about 20 minutes into the movie at this point. It's all set up. But it's never really clear. Eventually it becomes a lot more yeah, clear. Yeah, yeah. They do make it clear. But even so, the vampire of the title is not exactly what you expect. Not exactly. This is not a Dracula yeah. movie. It's not a typical vampire thing. Not cut and dried. But very cool. Lots of history of what led to these events of these people being in the house. I think the best part of the movie is not so much the, the plot. It's the scene. It's the location. Beautiful. It's all very moody and scenic. It's all clearly very low budget, but the location makes up for it. It's oh, all very yeah. creepy and claustrophobic, but it all feels like an actual real place. And great music. Really good music. I'd like to I'd love to live in that house. Oh yeah. Even the even the you know, I mean even, even with the in scary its beat bits. down condition. Yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. Um one weak plot point that we both noticed was how long it took. The archaeology. There's a metal pot. Half a metal pot. Yeah, it's a bronze. It's cauldron. basically it's, a it's big laying old cooking pot. It's laying in the dirt. It's not deeply buried because it's only half a pot, and it takes her like four days to dig it out of the dirt. And then, yeah, just how how long does this archaeology take? There's not that much to do. I mean, if you're unearthing <laughs> the pyramids, it could take some time. It's one pot in a guy's basement, and it's all all already almost completely dug up. <laughs> Yeah, they, they stretched that out for, they did, for yeah. no realistic reason. Well, they reason. needed a pretense for her to be there for days, and that was that was it. But, you know, a yeah. little, little bit of a weak point there. <laughs> yeah. Overall, what would you think? Thumbs up. I liked it. I liked it, yeah. Thought maybe, I thought it a was little a little bit slow. Long, a little bit, yeah, a little bit slow at parts. Um, but nice to look at, nice to, yeah. Yeah, if you're looking for a slasher film with lots of action, that's not this. No. This is suspenseful. It's 
kind of a mysterious. It's moody. It's definitely good. Yes. I'd go eight of ten. I think I would too. Yeah. I like yeah, that again, again mm-hmm. if you're looking for an action movie, don't do it. But if you like the moody stuff, this is good. Mm-hmm. And it's British, so it's all in English. Yes. Yes, it is. The accents aren't bad. No, no, they're not. They didn't seem that British. Okay. So, Mildly British. Thumbs down on the stuff. Thumbs up on The Crucible of the Vampire. I give the stuff a moderate thumbs up. Not a strong thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, it's getting time for the sun to come up, and since we're both vampires this week, Mm -hmm. we're going to have to get going. Time to go. The drive-in is closing down for the weekend. Stop in during the week at www.horrorbulletin.com for news and horror updates, to comment on this podcast, or to contact us. Check out our Twitter feed at, at Horror Bulletin. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter. Give us a shout out. Or, you know, our feedback or and request. You can, you can subscribe on the website, too, to get our mailings, and you can contact us through the website. Yeah, all our reviews, we do type up a short review of everything we see and post on the site, which goes out to our weekly mailing list. And if you're signed up, you'll get it in text as well as the podcast. For absolutely free. Completely 100% free. Technology. And we mentioned mailing list. There's no spam other than actual horror stuff. So we're not trying to sell you nothing. Nope. Okay, and that website was again www.horrorbulletin.com. I'm Kevin. And I'm Brian. See you next week. See ya. See ya.